I'm Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, and we're going to switch gears right now, and we're going to talk about a major redevelopment plan in St. Petersburg. The Tampa Bay Rays and their development partner, Heinz, plan to build a new baseball stadium. They want to, and residential and business developments on 86 acres near the downtown site of the current Tropicana Field. And they want St. Petersburg and Pinellas County taxpayers to foot much of the bill. St. Pete City Council took its first votes last week advancing the project, but it still needs final approval from council and from the Pinellas County Commission. And joining me now to talk about this is Carrie Mueller, a licensed professional engineer who has given a series of webinars about the redevelopment project on behalf of the group No Home Run. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me today. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on. So first, let's start with what is No Home Run? No Home Run is just a group of individuals like myself who have concerns on behalf of taxpayers and the future of the city. And we found each other mostly through public comments that we've made in city council meeting uh, meetings. And we have joined together to try to advocate for a better deal. And No Home Run, so... Um, let me ask you about your background. You're a licensed PE or professional engineer. Tell us what that is and why that um, qualifies you kind of to, to discuss a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. Sure, I'd be more than happy to. So I have a background working for public agencies like the city of Miami, as well as the city of Seattle. And also in Colorado, I work for the National Park Service. And we did a lot of work on contract administration, negotiating public-private partnerships. So public agencies often partner with private contractors and engineering firms to design infrastructure and building construction. So this is a similar type of project where the city of St. Petersburg is partnering with a private developer. And we just want to make sure that the, the deal itself is balanced for the public. I live in Campbell Park neighborhood. Neighborhood is just south of the existing stadium. And we have about 80% of our residents are in the uh, lower income range. And so we really want to advocate for our neighbors and make sure that this project is going to be good for our, our own neighborhood as well as the rest of the city. So you, we're going to talk a lot about the the costs perhaps today during during this discussion. Can you break down the costs to the team, to the developer, and to taxpayers? Sure. So there's two components to this project. There's the stadium as well as the real estate that's in the adjacent parking lot. So they're looking at asking the city of St. Petersburg for a subsidy for the stadium itself and the amount of $287.5 million dollars. And they're also asking City of St. Petersburg taxpayers for infrastructure for the adjacent real estate development in the amount of $142 million. But since we don't have those funds, we actually have to borrow them. And then we have to pay them back with interest over 30 years. So the total amount of debt that we have to take out is $686 million. And just for a frame of reference, our annual budget at the city is about $800 million. And to pay each year, we're going to pay about $23 million a year, which is about what we pay for affordable housing is an entire line item right now. And then the Rays are also asking for a subsidy for the stadium itself from the county in the form of bed taxes in the amount of $312.5 million. So, but we also have to take into consideration the value of the public land that the city currently owns and the fact that we're giving it to them at a deep discount, which many estimate to be at least $400 million. And the second cost to taxpayers is the loss of property tax revenue. When you have a stadium, they don't pay property taxes. So if you add up approximately $700 million for subsidies, plus $400 million for lost property taxes, plus $400 million for the discount on the land, right there is about $1.5 billion. And the city of St. Petersburg is pretty small. It's about 286 people, 286,000 people. So it's a lot of burden for each individual taxpayer. And regarding the, the taxes, 
part of this is will be coming through the in-town redevelopment area by extending the length of time that's already in place but they're going to extend they voted to extend that and it could if it if this project does happen that's what will happen it will it will get extended in years and they're banking on a seven percent increase in the value each year so uh, what do you think about, first of all, using the in-town redevelopment area tax increment financing and also whether that 7% number of, of the value increasing each year is, uh, is, is that risky or not? Yes, yeah, so many of us spoke last Thursday in public comments and opposition to extending the in-town CRA because we really need those tax dollars for our services for the city. And the in-town CRA will have been in place for 40 years and they're looking at extending it for another 20. So that's a 60 year timeline and CRAs really aren't supposed to be in place for that long. Uh, it was put into place because the downtown was economically disadvantaged and blighted in 1982, I believe. At this point, clearly we're no longer in that position and we need those funds for all of our city services. We have about $700 million worth of stormwater projects that need to be funded. So what we're looking at is taking 50% um, of the property taxes in the in-town CRA and diverting them to pay for the stadium subsidy as well as the infrastructure subsidy. And just so people know where the in-town CRA is, it's along Central Avenue as well as Beach Drive. And it encompasses some of the most valuable real estate in the city, as well as all the new high rises. So a lot of the people that are gonna move into those high rises they're going to demand city services. And at this point, we might have enough money in our general fund to cover our services, but as more and more people move here, the demand for services will obviously increase. And as time goes by, the cost of services will also increase. So it's almost guaranteed that we're going to need more tax dollars to cover both the increase in service and the increase in cost. And we're um, currently in a pretty good economy, but there's no guarantee that we're going to continue to have sustained growth. And if we've had such sustained growth for a long time, there's actually a probability that it might slow down. And over 30 years, the probability that we're not going to have any economic slowdowns or any events that cause, you know, an increased cost to the city is, you know, that's almost like not possible. Something will happen within these 30 years, and we're not necessarily going to have the extra funds or the bonding capability that we're going to need at that point, which will then potentially result in property taxes increasing, which is nothing that anyone wants. Everything is so expensive and people's housing costs are already sky high. You know, the, the price of new homes is expensive, which makes property taxes expensive. And so the new homeowners pay the highest property taxes because they don't have the homestead property tax exemption. And those property taxes also get passed on to renters. So that's our main concern. Our guest is Carrie Mueller, a licensed professional engineer who has given a series of webinars about the redevelopment project on behalf of the group No Home Run. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And uh, before we get too far, as far as uh, hearing some of the, your critiques of this, let's hear from uh, both both sides, I guess, we'll hear a report that we did from last Thursday's meeting, and we're going to hear from the mayor in just a little bit. We'll hear some recording, a recording of a couple of the things that he said around that time of that meeting. But here is um, just a short report from Megan Bowman, WMF's Megan Bowman, where this that says the city administration is focused on limiting its risks while still ensuring that the Tampa Bay Rays remain in St. Pete. So here's her report from last Thursday's meeting, and we'll be right back on Tuesday Cafe on WMNF Tampa. Mayor Ken Welch says the historic gas plant district will be an anchor for the community, but it comes at a high cost, over $1 billion, and the city and county will contribute nearly $600 million of it but the remainder will be paid for by the Rays Stadium Company, or STADCO. St. Pete's debt financing officer, Ann Fritz, says steps have been taken in the new agreement to mitigate the city's risks. Our amounts are fixed and all cost overruns are uh, the responsibility of STADCO. 
In the proposal, Stadco would take on the majority of operating costs, including insurance coverage. The group would also be responsible for all maintenance and repairs for the new facility. Megan Bowman, WMNF News in Tampa. So that's our report um, that included a quote from the city about that they were trying to mitigate the risks. So let me ask my guest, Carrie Mueller, a licensed professional engineer who is uh, representing the group No Home Run today, about whether you think that the deal that's on the table right now, at least what we know about the deal, and we can get more about get into more about that later, does is the city mitigating its risk or is it taking a lot of financial risks? Well, again, there's two parts of the project. There's the stadium project and there's the real estate development. So when we're talking about the stadium, they try to frame that the Rays are paying half and the city and county are paying the other half. But you have to remember that we're foregoing any property tax revenue on the actual land that the stadium will be sitting on. So we are losing property tax revenue as well. And then we're not receiving any rent other than $1 million per year. And we're not we're not seeing any revenue sharing from the TV streaming rights, which is a, a significant income source for the Rays. And if the Rays do sell in the future, we're not going to see any share of the, of the sale of the team. And in addition to that, we don't get any naming rights. And currently, there's a 50 cent per turnstile turn that the city receives. So we'll no longer receive that. So it's really not as balanced as it is presented. And I know there are some things they're trying to transfer to the Rays itself as far as maintenance of the stadium or having the insurance paid for by the stadium, which is appreciated. But nonetheless, the stadium deal is actually quite unbalanced, considering the fact that we're not receiving any revenue sharing. And then if you also consider the private real estate development, it doesn't make any sense that we're giving them the land. It's such a deep discount. They have offered a purchase price of $105 million but they're only going to pay $50 million in the first 12 years, which is about $4 million a year. And then we're also providing $142 million of infrastructure for their private real estate development. And we're not receiving any profits or any profit sharing. And it doesn't make any sense that we're selling the land at such a deep discount. Heinz just bought a warehouse in Tampa in October of last year, and they paid $46 million so can you imagine if Heinz went to the seller of the warehouse and said, I'm just going to pay you $4 million a year for 12 years. I'm not going to provide a down payment. I'm not going to increase the amount for interest or the time value of money. And as soon as I pay you the first payment, I'm going to be able to flip it and sell it to someone else. And that's exactly how the terms of the current deal are set up. So those are the criticisms that we have with the deal. We want it to be more balanced. And I kind of alluded to this earlier, that, but the documents for the, at least when they went into the last Thursday's meeting, the Committee of the Whole there in St. Petersburg, the documents were not finalized, and but there are some assurances that they will be before a final vote, but that vote seems to be coming up on a deadline pretty quickly because City Council is on summer break right now, and a few days before July 11th, They'll be coming back from the their break, and then the next vote is scheduled right now, at least, for July 11th. What do you think about that timeline? I think that there are three council members currently that are really listening to the public and trying to represent the public's interests. And I think it's really important for the public to hear what they have to say and to reach out to them and ask how they can support their efforts, because they are asking the real questions. They're asking, why are we voting on documents? that are not complete. And they're also asking, why are we rushing through this process? Why is that necessary for the public? And also why is it necessary even for the Rays? Because the Rays say they need to have their stadium built by 2028. So we have to rush this process to make, to make that timeline work. But if we're at the point where the documents aren't even complete, it doesn't seem to be good for anybody. And I think many council members have alluded to that and have made comments to that. So I would recommend everyone watch the previous city council meeting to listen to the vote to set the date as July 11th. And right now they're on uh, break until July 7th. They come back, they have a second committee of the whole meeting for the real estate development on July 9th. And then they have a vote on both parts of the deal on July 11th. 
So how are they supposed to read through two different development agreements, one for the stadium and one for the real estate development, such a short period of time? And if anyone listened to the previous committee of the whole for the real estate development, many council members brought up issues with the actual agreement itself that show that it wasn't quite ready for their review. So they didn't have an opportunity to really review it as a whole and make a decision whether they agree with it or not, because they were reading it to find areas that still were incomplete and needed to be addressed. And so it's obvious that it's being rushed. And I would just listen and read Lizette Hanowitz's op-ed in the Tampa Bay Times, because she goes through some of the issues that are in the current development agreement that are problematic. And she's the only attorney that's on council, and she's really working her hardest to try to represent our best interests, and we need to be able to support her, support her in doing so. Our guest is Carrie Mueller, a licensed professional engineer who has given a series of webinars about the redevelopment project on behalf of the group No Home Run. They oppose that current deal proposed by the Tampa Bay Rays for a new stadium and development in the historic gas plant district of St. Petersburg. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. I'm Sean Canan. Uh, let's hear just a couple of short clips from the mayor. St. Pete Mayor Ken Welch said the $1.3 billion development is more than a stadium. He called it an anchor of the community. It is the foundation for an unprecedented opportunity for jobs, housing, shared economic opportunity, and yes, honoring the promises to the gas plant community. The promise was not in the gas plant community, that's a historically black community that was kind of raised to, to put in the TROP and to put in the, the um, other, other development there. Uh, so here's more of when Ken Welch was saying that it's important to avoid skewing promises to fit other people's agendas. He says he wants to get the best deal for the city. Never to sell the land to the highest bidder, nor was it to replace the economically diverse historical gas plant community with predominantly low-income houses. The promise was equitable economic development. And Welch says the development is projected to bring in more than 37,000 jobs. So let me bring it back to our guest, Carrie Mueller. Um, what do you, what can you say about the jobs that the mayor is, is um, pr predicting or projecting and also about um, the economic engine that this development, if it's, if it's ever built would create for the historic gas plant community. Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, obviously, we really want to see that area developed. It's a hole in the middle of our downtown area, and it's a great location. We have so many people that could take advantage of jobs in that location, so we, we fully support developing it. And we're not looking for just the highest and best use. We're open to different types of use of that proper, property itself. But we also want to make sure we're actually getting, going to get the benefits that are promised, and the benefits include affordable housing, they include jobs and they include homage to the existing um, site and the, the history of that site, which is clearly very important. However, we sat on the Community Benefits Advisory Council for five different Tuesdays uh, for many hours uh, from like 5 p.m. to 1030 at night and members of the public attended so that they could speak at the very end of the, the, of the meeting. They worked all day and then they came to the meeting to be able to speak about what was important to them. Many of them asked for affordable housing. And unfortunately, there's only 200 units that are um, on site that are less than 80% AMI. And the rest of the units, the developer has 30 years to build them out. So I don't think that there's much affordable housing at all. And as, in regards to jobs, the jobs are associated with the construction of the site. And I would just say that we have many construction projects going on and we need very many people in the local area to fill those jobs currently. Uh, we have a shortage of labor as it stands, and we have a lot of programs where people can get quick entry into high paying jobs in construction. And I think it's a great pathway for people to not have to spend a lot of money on education or time, and they can start working right away and earning high um, incomes as well as getting benefits that can then be used to afford whether it's rent or to buy a home. So I think there's a lot of existing opportunities currently, but as far as um, the benefits go, we asked uh, unanimously in our committee, uh, we voted for 11 different benefits. And unfortunately, many of them were not included by the raise in the actual development agreement. And it's just very unfortunate because that community benefit um, agreement is it's supposed to represent um, what the community receives out of a substantial public investment. 
And I voted no, that I did not believe that the benefits were adequate compared to the amount of public investment. So the promises of this job have been housing, but we're actually not getting a lot of housing um, jobs, but we already have a lot of construction jobs that are going unfulfilled. We would like to see more professional knowledge-based jobs that are higher income jobs. And we're hoping to get more office buildings in that space. And Heinz is an incredible office developer. So we were hopeful that we would see quite a bit of office space, but within the first 10 years, they're only required to build 333,000 square feet of various types of real estate, including half of which must be class A office. So that's like 166,000 square feet within the first 10 years. And just for reference, we're building a project where the old police station was located. It's called Orange Station or the Central. And it's a class A office building. It's a mid-rise and it's 125,000 square feet. So within the first 10 years, we're getting the equivalent of two mid-size office towers. So it's really not what we were expecting as far as the amount of development. So I'm not really sure it's going to bring those high paying office jobs that we were hoping for. And also I just wanted to bring up that the Southern Poverty Law Center recently filed a letter with the city and they're alleging that there are civil rights violations with this project. They can't take action until the vote is completed. But if the project is approved by city council, the Southern Poverty Law Center will likely file a lawsuit alleging civil rights violations. And no one in our city wants that to happen. No one wants to um, participate, participate in a project um, that's violating civil rights laws. So I would encourage people to read through that letter. It's 28 pages. And we just really wanna make sure that we do the right thing with this project and that the promises that are made are actually going to be delivered. And at this point, we do not have faith that that's actually what's going to happen. And I haven't read that letter from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Do you, can you outline a couple of the things they point out that they say might be civil rights violations if this project goes forward? Sure, so they're concerned that there's a perpetuation of um, damage to the African-American community with the previous displacement of the gas plant residents that will once again occur. And one of the things in regards to the property itself is that when this was originally happened in the 80s, they used HUD funds as well as community block development grant funding, federal financing, and it has restrictions on how the land can be used. It has to be used for the public's benefit. It cannot be used for private developers profits. And so unfortunately by transferring public land to a private developer for profits, I don't know if that's going to be in compliance with the restrictions from the original financing. And so people say, well, then what are we gonna do? We're not gonna be able to develop it, but that's not true. We can retain ownership of that land and lease it to a developer and still be able to have the mixed use development that everybody wants and for an example, you can look at the Washington DC project that Heinz recently completed. And you can see that the city of Washington DC retained ownership of the land and leased it to Heinz. And Heinz has been very successful and has seen quite a bit of profits from that property. So there are ways to make this work for everybody. Our guest is Carrie Mueller, a licensed professional engineer who has given a series of webinars about the redevelopment project. On behalf of the group No Home Run, they oppose the current deal proposed by this Tampa Bay Rays for a new stadium and development in the historic gas plant district of St. Pete. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. I'm Sean Canan. And Carrie, you mentioned a few minutes ago um, the... the uh, whether the sale of the land was being undervalued, but there's really kind of no way to know for sure what the value of the land is because there hasn't been an appraisal lately. What is the status of that? That's a great point. And I really appreciate you bringing it up because we have a bunch of engineers that have done an analysis on the current appraisal. And we feel that the comparables aren't very valid because a lot of them aren't actually in the city of St. Petersburg or in the actual area itself. And we would really like to see a new appraisal. We also commissioned a poll through Mason Dixon. It was quite expensive. We raised funds through individuals and we had it completed through a reputable polling company so that we couldn't be criticized for not doing a professional poll. We did use a professional polling company that has a great reputation. 
And Mason Dixon asked the public if they felt that a new appraisal should be completed in um, 80, sorry, I think it was 86% agreed that a new appraisal should be completed. And in addition, they also asked that uh, elect an election referendum would be held. The question was if they felt that a new stadium construction deal uh, would that requires the expenditure of city tax dollars should or should not require approval by city voters in a local election referendum. And 82% said it should require a referendum. So it's a majority of the public that is asking for a new appraisal, as well as 72% thinks the proposed financial deal should be further negotiated. Uh, and 74% don't think the current proposed financial deal is fair. So I think it's very important for the current rep representatives to listen to the public because they have a responsibility to represent the public. And clearly the public has spoken that they believe a new appraisal should be completed, that this issue should be on a referendum so that they have the opportunity to vote. They don't think that this is a fair deal and they would like the chance for the city council to renegotiate. And I, I really hope that our representatives will listen to us. The legal fees in last Thursday's meeting, they were the the cap on those was raised to one and a half million dollars, and some of the city council members and maybe the people in the public during that meeting were talking about the the fact that the the there were so many legal fees happening right now because of the rush to get this all done and completed by mid July. Um, your thoughts on on the the amount that the city is spending on legal fees to get this deal done? Yes, I just think our priorities are really screwed up. I mean, we have so many needs that are going unmet. I mean, we're going to have so many storms this summer that are going to result in a significant amount of rainfall. And we're already dealing with so many flooding issues. And some of the issues are related to elevations that properties are located on. But a lot of the flooding issues are related to infrastructure that needs to be updated and these are things that we know about and we could address by prioritizing them and allocating funding to them. And so I just think about the residents who are suffering from repeated flooding, knowing that it's an infrastructure issue that could be repaired, but it's not being prioritized. And instead, the city is paying another half of a million dollars on top of the existing million dollars for outside legal counsel, which is clearly because we're on this rush timeline and I would just add, in addition to the, you know, the outside legal counsel that we're funding, we're still working with documents that aren't quite ready to be voted on. So I just don't know what the rush is. Why can't the Rays play one more year in their existing stadium? There's nothing wrong with it. It's not damaged. We have actual infrastructure that is damaged and it does need to be repaired and that should be prioritized with allocating our funds. And as we end the show, uh, one last thing I want to ask you about is one of the the uh, aspects of this redevelopment would be there would be a brand new African-American History Museum on the site. So your thoughts about that and, and uh, it being part of this deal and whether if even if there's renegotiations, if that might be still something that that is included. I mean, I'm actually optimistic about the museum. I think that there's a good chance that it could be built, but I do want to emphasize that they're not, the Rays aren't actually paying um, the, the full cost of the museum. They're only contributing $10 million toward the construction cost, which would likely be somewhere around 30 to $40 million. And they have a precondition that the African American History Museum has to complete a guaranteed maximum price uh, process to know what it's going to cost. And they have to show that they are able to raise half of the funds by July 1st, 2025. And that's a condition that has to be met before they can get the $10 million. And I agree with Lizette Hanowitz, as well as Gina Driscoll. We don't believe that there should be preconditions for that $10 million because that's actually the public's money. And Ray Hines asks, acts like that money is a gift, that it's a developer contribution, but it's actually the city's money to begin with because it's a payment in lieu of the land. So that $50 million is actually a payment for the land itself. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe today, Carrie. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.
Thank you to Carrie Mueller is a licensed professional engineer who has given a series of webinars about redevelopment on the on behalf of No Home Run. They oppose the deal in the for the Tampa Bay Rays as it's listed now. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Thanks so much to Equality Florida's Director of Transgender Equality, Angelique Godwin. Stay tuned for Wavemakers and then for Wide Awake America. This is WMNF Tampa. Thanks to everyone who supports community radio.